In November of 2018, I visited Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Museum, with Bishop Godby and Apostle Aramis. As we stared together at pictures of Jews who'd been lynched by the Nazis, I will never forget that feeling of looking at those pictures as they saw some of their communal history in mine and I saw some of mine in theirs. As often happens to me when I visit Yad Vashem, the sheer enormity of the loss and the evil overwhelmed me. And at the end of the museum's journey in the Hall of Names, I broke down and cried. Bishop Godby and Pastor Aramis hugged me and cried together. And they told me through tears, never again. When I saw the video of a white police officer with his knee on the neck of George Floyd for more than eight minutes, it is hard for me to describe a mixture of anger and pain and revulsion that I felt and how much I wanted to find Ronald and Aramis and to hug them as they hugged me and to tell them black lives matter. The killings of George Floyd Amud Arbery, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor are part of our nation's too long history of police brutality against the African American community. They are a few examples of racism that continues to plague our society. Examples of our failure to unlearn racism. That unlearning of racism is our moral imperative. She gave a speech called Religion and Race at a conference of the same name. There he met Dr. Martin Luther King and the two became friends, became friends before Rabbi Heschel would march with Dr. King in Selma in 1965. And I reread Heschel's speech a few days ago and wanna share with you a few sentences from his speech. He begins at the first conference on religion and race. The main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. Moses' words were, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me. And Pharaoh retorted, who is the Lord that I should heed this voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Heschel says the outcome of that summit has not yet come to an end. Pharaoh is not ready to capitulate. The exodus began, but it is far from having been completed. In fact, it was easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than for a black man to cross certain university campuses. And the, that summit has never ended. It's easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than it is for some African Americans in this country to drive a car without fear, to walk in the streets without fear. Heschel continues, religion and race. How can the two be uttered together? To act in the spirit of religion is to unite what lies apart, to remember that humanity as a whole is God's beloved child. To act in the spirit of race is to sunder, to slash, to dismember the flesh of living humanity. Is this a way to honor a parent, to torture his child? How can we hear the, ra the word race and feel no self-reproach? 
Finally, Heschel says, the way we act, the way we fail to act is a disgrace, which must not go on forever. He gave these words in 1963. He says, this is not a white man's world. This is not a colored man's world. It is God's world. No man has a place in this world who tries to keep another man in his place. It is time for the white man to repent. Racism is an evil of tremendous power, but God's will transcends all powers. Surrender to despair is surrender to evil. He says it's important to feel anxiety but it's sinful to wallow in despair. What we need is a total mobilization of heart, intelligence, and wealth for the purpose of love and justice. God is in search of man, waiting, hoping for man to do his will. Daily, we should ask, what have I done to alleviate the anguish, to mitigate the evil, to prevent humiliation. Heschel's, Heschel was a prophet, and his words still echo and still need to enter our hearts. I told Ronald and Aramis when I asked them if they would do this call tonight, especially at this time, that the last thing I want to do is to place a further burden on them. We as a community have internal work to do and tuning into the River Church on Sunday morning as we did or listening tonight, all of us who are here cannot be an excuse for continued, cannot be an excuse for not continuing our own self-examination and not doing the work of rooting out racism in our own communities and in our country. But I also believe deeply, and both of my friends know this, I believe deeply in the power of listening, in the power of building lasting and meaningful friendships and relationships as the soil in which true change and meaningful work can grow. It's why I'm grateful for the experience I had a few years ago in Israel. It's why I'm grateful to share the journey of religious leadership with Bishop Godby here in Durham. And it's why I'm grateful for tonight as another step in the process of our getting to know each other with love and truth as our foundation. So, I want to turn to you, Aramis, if it's all right. I'm going to turn to you. I haven't heard your voice in, in such a long time, although it's good to catch up for a few minutes. But I want to just ask you to begin um, the Facebook video that you posted touched me very deeply and, and helped me to just find myself in the turmoil of the last couple of weeks. And I would just love to ask you to share a little bit more of what your experience um, has been as a leader in the African-American community over these past couple of weeks and to share with us what, what we need to know. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Dan. Um, first of all, it's good to be able to join uh, with everyone. I greet you from Breakers Covenant Church International in Detroit, Michigan. And um, the fact that um, last I heard we had 45 people joined in, uh, spoke volumes in itself about the type of congregation that you, you have and the type of leadership that you uh, actually provide. And so thank you once again, Rabbi Dan. And, um, I'll jump right in. Um, if, if ever you can't hear me or something, someone just let me know. But uh, yes, I did do a Facebook uh, post. And um, honestly, it happened impromptu. It wasn't planned. I had just read uh, a post from a white pastor, and it, and it grieved my heart so deeply. And only the people listening here would know that that's really what tipped me 
to the point of just having to go live. And it was because the post was from someone who actually has committed their lives over 25 years of doing what, what would be what they call urban ministry, ministry in the urban community. And um, the first post that they put out uh, since George Floyd's um, murder, it started this way. Racism has been around for a long time. And then it went into other countries and how things are so much worse in other places. And not once in probably this two page uh, piece did this individual even acknowledge the death of George Floyd, empathize at all with the black community, but has been running their ministry for the last 25 years in the name of helping to lift those in underserved communities, particularly blacks. And so I was grieved because that portrait is a portrait, unfortunately, of so many of, uh, of the white leaders, pastors, Christian pastors in, in the nation, and it's indicative of the type of narrative that's, that's plagued our nation for 400 years. So in that time, honestly, you all, I was broken. I was broken and I felt like the life of me was leaking, like leaking completely. Um, I wanted to say just from the start that I believe that you asked a question about what, what is it like to lead, especially in the last two weeks as a African-American pastor. And I always tell my congregation and those that know me, you cannot lead anybody any further than you're willing to go. Right. So in this type of situation, the first challenge that I have is me doing uh, introflection. Like, what are my values? Am I firm in my stance? I mean, under pressure, what will I do? Am I going to change how I feel about individuals? Am I going to come to rash conclusions and, and, and make up new rules and build up new walls of division when I when I tell everyone that I'm about reconciliation. Uh, and so the first uh, challenge for sure was within me um, because I bring a message of love, a message of hope, a message of integrity, of justice and of unity. And I had to ensure within myself with the plethora of emotions that I was feeling that at the end of the day that I had not deviated in my own core values as far as who I am and why I do what I do. And then secondly, uh, in endeavoring to empathize uh, with the cries of blacks all around America and honestly throughout the world. Um, and I know we're not talking about COVID-19, but to really understand the depth of this cry, you have to, you have to relate to the disparity that was clearly uh, uncovered when it comes to the, 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 the ability or how the ease of ability for African-Americans or Blacks uh, to disproportionately become ill uh, with this COVID-19 and also die, you know? And so, bam, as if that isn't enough, as, as if our community is not already feeling like uh, we're at the bottom of the totem pole, right? We've been here since the beginning for some reason in all of these years of toil and all of these years of struggle and all of these years of pain and trauma, after 400 years, we're still at the bottom. And that was just overwhelming. So at George Floyd and the other two uh, that were killed, uh, Amaya Arbery and um, I forget the young lady's name that was just in her home, Brianna uh, Taylor or something like that, and, and it's just overwhelming. So anger, frustration, confusion, all those things you all are going through my own mind. And at the same time, I'm trying to empathize with the weight of the black community. Um, it's a lot. And, and with all of that, I'll say that I also understand that with the narrative that the media is pushing out that everyone in America that isn't my color skin, everyone isn't 
anti-black people. Everyone doesn't aim to, to be prejudiced or to discriminate against blacks. You know, everyone's not okay with the disparities and, you know, and so I know that right now it's almost difficult to even bring that topic up, but as a leader, I am also resonating in my heart about the reality that there are people who care, who feel like they can't say anything because the fragility of what the black community is dealing with can almost misconstrue anything or any effort they try to make uh, to empathize or to share the burden. And so growing up in a white community from age five to 15, my best friends were white. My first five girlfriends were white. You know, I white education all the way up to 15. I wrestled, played soccer. I, I mean, sports with a whole lot of white people. My pastor that ordained me is white. So in all of my frustration, I don't want it to be lost that I know that at the heart level, there are several individuals of, of very different skin tones that care very much for the black community uh, as uh, do uh, blacks. And so as a leader, I feel the burden of responsibility to make sure that I keep my focus around the, the reconcili reconciliation work that I've committed myself to for several years to make sure that uh, number one, I don't allow for the tension of the times uh, to, to dull in my understanding that I work every day concerning uh, race problems in our nation. This isn't something that I started in the last two weeks. It's not something I started in the last month or last uh, two years. In fact, the fact that we were in Israel together, um, Rabbi Daniel and, 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 and Bishop, we were there hanging out together and we cried together. Look, he talked about us crying together uh, at the, Memo the Holocaust Memorial. But guess what? When we were sitting around the table, I believe it was for, was it for a Pesach dinner? I can't remember what, what meal it was, but I'm telling you, we hit a, a juncture where we're celebrating the Jewish community being able to re-inhabit a land that they had been uh, pushed out of the diaspora. And, and, and there's a grief. There was a celebration that the black pastors felt, but there was a grief as well because we were asking the question, where is our home? And I think I might have been the most dramatic, <laughs> the most emotional at that time. I wept to the point I left the table and leaned on the wall. And another rabbi came and put his arm on my shoulder and said that he was there for me. And like uh, Rabbi Daniel was saying, that this relational work is the difference being able to empathize with one another's positions and experiences, and um, at the same time defying this uh, long-lived narrative uh, that says that that, that there, are cl there are classes of people that deserve to be respected uh, differently, when in truth, uh, there should be dignity for all humanity. So for me, it's just more so embracing with great strength my my foundation, my moral values, so that I can lead people somewhere that I'm actually going and not asking people to go somewhere that I myself haven't uh, resolved my heart to lead them in. And, and I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Uh, Bishop. So Rabbi Danny G. <laughs> <laughs> I call him that, guys, because he holds a special place in my heart. No disrespect, but he's my brother and he's my friend. If you saw me reaching, it was because I was scrolling through. I was scrolling through to see your faces. Uh, so many of your faces I cherish and I miss. I miss you tremendously. Uh, the work that we've done together is something that gives me hope. Uh, I have a little unique perspective in a moment like this because I often tell people, uh, when you get in the midst of a storm, it reveals what you did before the storm. And in the midst of this storm, it was revelation of what we did before. Um, in a moment of great confusion and a moment of great 
doubt and disbelief and being disheartened by what I had seen, I got a text from a friend, a text from Rabbi Danny G, a text that anchored me and grounded me and reminded me that the injustices that I was witnessing was not a reflection of all, but that there are people that, again, as Aramis said, don't share my skin color, but they share my concerns and my plight. That was my greatest moment of confusion was wondering if anybody cared. Hearing so many people deflect and so many people look to shame and blame the victims in these incidents, I wondered, did anybody care? Um, in a moment of rage, after watching the video, I had to go out that night and minister to my congregation and I had to make a difficult decision, one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. So um, outraged by what I had seen, I made a decision in place of my sermon to show the killing of George Floyd. Um, unedited, uncut, with every expletive, with every image, with every bit of horror that I had just witnessed before having to go out to minister to my congregation. How could I minister to them when I needed to be ministered to? But it was a watershed moment for us and it was something that I felt that we could grapple with and struggle with together. And if nobody else understood, I was hoping that I would find empathy and sympathy in those that I pastor and that we could come together and maybe reason and find some way to move beyond this moment. And so I played the video and then I began to dissect it with a young man who's a psychologist in my church and another one of our leaders. And we began to talk about it and try to make some sense of something that really made no sense. I walked away from that moment um, without words, you know, um, because this was greater than uh, black or white conversation. This made me question humanity. This made me question how one human being could do that to another with no empathy, with no sympathy, with no sense of understanding as to what they were doing. Was this a model and was this a type and shadow of where America really was? Um, what this represented for me was a far greater picture of than seeing even an African-American man killed on the streets of America. This to me was a picture of what America looked like in this moment. Then to recognize that there's a great leadership void in our country to have leadership that didn't empathize, to have leadership that, again, sought to shame and blame the victim rather than to understand, is this the America that I live in? Then it conflicted me theologically. Um, do people who preach the same Bible that I preach, do we serve the same God? And so I've got all this tension reigning in me while I'm trying to lead all the people who look to me for answers. And I got tears coming down my face. I'm shaking my fists and wondering why and how and what is this nation that we're living in? Is not this my home as much as anyone else's? Um, when we had that moment that Aramis talked about in Israel, Never will forget one of the seasoned rabbis came to me and he hugged me walking out. He said very little words to me. But this one thing that he said to me, he said, you do have a home and it is a place called America. And you have an opportunity to take advantage of things that others may have never had before you and also coming after you. At first I took offense to that. I said, how dare you 
in this moment where we celebrate your land, tell me that my land is a place where I'm not accepted, a place where I'm not valued, a place where I can live on the same block as someone else and be viewed through different lenses. I can drive the same cars as someone else and people wonder how, do, how did I get that? Um, but yet you say that this is my land. But I learned that that was a profound statement and this really is my land. And this moment made me profoundly aware of how much America equally belongs to me as it does to anyone else and that I have an obligation to fight for my position in this land. I, I've fought this fight for a long time on many different levels, but this moment made me keenly aware that I had to put boots to ground and I had to protest and I had to be a part of things that had at so many places in time, I thought that I was above and beyond that. When I've watched people march through streets and wondered what would that solve and why are they doing that? In some way, I thought I was above the protests and the rage and the even place that people feel like a need to loot. Um, that is as much part of this conversation as anything else. People are economically depressed and we need to stop pointing fingers and we need to start asking questions. How did we create a society where people have that as their recourse? How have we created a, a society where these things are possible? And so I felt a need as a leader to get involved in the get engaged. And so my brother flew in and he and my son and I went to a protest. First that I'd ever been to in my life. Um, didn't go to be a part of it, didn't go uh, to have anything else but presence. And to be a part of the collective body of people, both past and present, who have raised their voices against injustice. So for the first time, I found myself in the middle of a march. And the first time I found myself in the middle of a place that I never thought I'd be in. And I looked around with tears in my eyes and someone recognized me who was holding the event and asked me, would I speak? And I really didn't want to speak. I didn't really come to speak, but I was provoked to speak. And when I spoke, I spoke things that I never thought I'd have to say. And I spoke to things that I thought in private, but never really wanted to share in public. And I was deeply affected that I had to speak things that I was only able to contemplate in a private place. But now my private thoughts had to be brought into a public arena. And that is, how I feel about the things that happen to people who carry the, skin, the same skin hue as myself, the injustices and the inequities that I know are there and I see them daily, but in effort to build bridges with other communities, sometimes I turn a blind eye to that and act like it's not there and hope that it's not there to fit into the conversations of those hoping to create this collective body of people that can get beyond this. But I had to confront it and I had to speak to it and I had to challenge it. In the midst of it, I had to say things that I know would hurt people that I pastor. In the midst of it, I had to say things that I know would challenge people that I pastor. In the midst of it, I had to point out ugly truths that to be quite honest, I know would challenge people that I love and that I live in community with every day, but I had to say it. And so to say that this moment has been something that um, has been easy to navigate, I'd be lying to you if I said so. Um, but from it, I'm still hopeful uh, because I have 
a text from Rabbi Danny G because I can scroll through these faces and see people that I connect with in community daily. And because there's relationship that's bigger than this. And I am more than hopeful. And I know that sometimes things have to get to their worst before we can see it become its best. And I believe that this is one of those moments where we're seeing the covers pulled off so that we can finally once and for all and forever deal with things that we have swept under the rug and deal with things that we have dismissed and deal with things that we didn't understand so we would rather accuse it and indict it rather than to sit to seek to understand it. I think finally once and for all and forever we'll deal with this and 2020 will be a hallmark moment and it will be the year that America dealt with its demons and with the, the inequities that can take continue to divide us. And so with that being said, Rabbi, please continue to carry us for um, So I'm, I'm deeply humbled by both, you know, by what you both shared. Um, I think what I would, you know, what I would love to hear from you, um, you know, I, I want to name something, which is both of you talked about the importance of not, of, of, of how devastating it is when people just move past pain and ignore it and they make this about, you know, a policy issue or something like that. And, 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 and I think we, it's so uncomfortable. Um, I mean, maybe we as pastors have gotten more used to what it means to, to just sit in those moments, but I think a lot of times there's a, it's just so scary and uncomfortable to, to scoot past them, but that's actually where the real growth happens. Um, and, and so I wanna be very careful just to acknowledge and, and thank you for what you said, because, um, you know, and, and if I can, I'll just take a moment, you know, that Aramis, when you talked about that moment um, about uh, around the Shabbat table, I remember um, there was a young woman who, uh, who's an African-American pastor who said, um, Wakanda's not real. And she sort of, it, it was this, she, she put it in, in this, I, I had never in my life thought about that sensation of, you know, Ronald, when you said, you know, I, I have as right as much America, you know, as right, a, as much a right to America as anybody else. The first thing that I'm thinking to myself is why do you need to say that? Yeah. Like, what, why is it like, you know, what, why is it necessary for that to be something that's even, you know, that that's even put out there? Um, I, the, so I just, I want to acknowledge that. And I also am curious, we, we trust each other and, and we lo I love you and I know you love me. And, 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 and so the truth is, is I'm curious, you know, Aramis and Ronald, and you can figure out what order, but like, I want to know what hard truths that I need to know. Um, and if you don't want to make it about me, um, the Jewish community, um, about, you know, white America, uh, and I, and I want to be very careful because, um, as I wrote to my, to our congregation, uh, and as you saw in Israel, right, uh, there are many Jews of color mm -hmm. and in America, so much of the Jewish community is Ashkenaz and, and, and is white in skin color, right? But, um, so, and, and for those people in our congregation um, and in the Jewish community, this is an even more complicated time. And, 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 and part of what I have tried to do is to also make sure that people in the Jewish community, in, my, in our own congregation, feel seen and known and understood and, and the very tricky place that they um, inhabit in these moments. 
Um, but I, you know, I want to move past a little, you know, I want to hear from you. What, what are the things that, what are the difficult truths that, that we need to hear um, and the difficult work that you think, you know, that, that we need to do? Uh, yeah, I defer to Erebus. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, Bishop, Bishop, I'll, I'll go first. And I'll just give one thing. Of course, there's a number, but maybe we can take turns. But one of the things I ponder on a lot is the reality that um, this nation, the United States of America, is a nation of uh, immigrants. And um, when I talk about trying to understand um, through the lens of someone other than, than myself and through an experience other than my own, um, for immigrants, usually they leave where they lived and they come to another land anticipating, having heard of and hopeful of a better opportunity where they go. And so whether you come from Europe, whether you come from Asia, whether you come from the Caribbean, um, whether you come from, you know, South America, what have you, uh, many people have migrated, of course, uh, to the United States because it's been proven to be a land of opportunity um, from, for, from its rich history. And the unfortunate reality is when you come to the United States to escape uh, where you were and looking forward to a better opportunity in the United States, it gives you a certain type of view of the United States and you wanna protect that because if you came from the rural hills of Jamaica or another uh, Caribbean island and, and you didn't even have consistent electricity and you couldn't hardly keep an internet connection and you, you couldn't get a laptop or, or what have you, or you had no opportunities to really go beyond the island. And so coming to America is a big step up. And so from that perspective, individuals who came to this nation, which is almost everybody except those who originally discovered the land, uh, you know, back in the early 1600s or what have you. But that perspective, people want to protect because ultimately you're going to want to protect what made your life better. You know, you're going to want to protect what gave you opportunities that you didn't have before. And so when you see Black Americans, and I don't say African Americans, I try to avoid saying that because Africa is a continent, not a country. And so when we say African Americans, you're lumping all uh, Africans into one category, whereas any other uh, culture or, or ethnicity, they will be distinguished more so from the country that they came from. And so you think about a lot of Black Americans who were brought here on slave ships, and we are the only ones, the absolute only ones who came to this nation against our will. The only ones. We didn't say, get us up out of Africa because we're looking for some better opportunities. Because doing so would have give us, given us the opportunity to decide if we were going to be okay with how we, we would be treated when we got here. You know, we would be able to assess, is this somewhere we want to be or is this somewhere we don't want to be? We would be able to assess whether it's going to be worth sacrificing, not being with your family, letting go of your culture and embracing a new constitution. We would have been able to look at the situation, make a decision, and then come in hopes for a better opportunity. And even if it goes bad, we know that we made the choice ourselves. And Blacks are the only ones Descendants of African slaves are the only ones who are here and did not get to make a decision to be here. And as a result, having helped to build this nation, having been considered less than humane, having been branded like animals, sold off, you know, like animals, breed, you know, breed it like bred like animals having watched our loved ones rape, our family stripped apart, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on, right? No one wants to really hear that, but that is our history. That is our history in America. 
And I think that that's the hardest thing for people to really grapple with because ultimately they're seeing a tale of two, of, of two nations. They're seeing two stories playing uh, at the same time about the same place. And our story just happens to hinge upon the side of American history that no one wants to have to go back and look at. But if you say, why don't we take care of our neighborhoods? Or if you say, why is it that you're so violent? Or if you say, how come you don't take care of your homes? And why aren't there two uh, parents in your homes? And why are you having babies and you don't have a husband or a partner or what have you, however you want to look at it? You know, we can trace, right? When you get, when someone is dealing with an illness, you trace back to try to find out beyond the symptoms, what was the cause? And when we trace back, you're asking us, why are our families stripped apart when this nation stripped them apart? You're asking, why are we so violent if that's the way you want to ca characterize us? Uh, but the truth is, all we saw was violence. And we were taught violence by the people who brought us here. We were, we were taught what it was to watch a man get beat for no reason, lynched for no reason, dragged down the street for no reason. We were taught every type of heinous thing you could think of with images constantly going through our minds from so-called Christian slave owners. And so our story is different. We didn't hop on the boat. We didn't, we didn't save up money and get on the plane. And, and, and when people say, well, our people came and we started from the bottom and we worked our way up, why can't the black people do that? That is a very famous narrative that everybody says. But you have to understand, your nation, that is the land of opportunity for you, 600 plus thousand people died just trying to classify blacks as worth being equated to as a human being. Now you think about that. What type of psychological madness is going on in the minds of citizens when you would rather kill over a half a million people than just say this person with darker complected skin deserves to have the same uh, values and dignities as everybody else. Our narrative is so much different. We are not immigrants. And we should not be identified as immigrants because we were snatched and brought here against our will, stripped of our culture. We can't trace it back to Africa. We can't trace our names. We can't trace our heritage. We've got nothing but what the United States offers us. And what they were supposed to offer us that they haven't offered us is justice equality for all. All men are created equal and provided with these unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Black people are, we're exhausted. We've been a faith people since we got here. We pray hard, we sing hard. You come to our churches, we praise hard. We do everything in our power not to be violent with individuals who have been inhumane towards blacks since we've been here. Forgiveness, we can teach a, the class on it. You know, mercy, we can teach the class on it. Prayer, we can teach the class on it. Pray, we can teach the class. Why? Because if anything happened, there are people that won't come back to the city right now because a black man did something to one of their loved ones whether it was a shooting, a robbery, or whatever, and they will never step foot back in the city again. But we were the victims of crimes that cannot be expressed with words, and we're being told to get over it. And that's just really, really difficult to try to understand. And so um, I would want people to ponder on the idea of that that tug of war between this is the nation that gave me better opportunities, but oh, this doesn't fare for people who are descendants of African slaves because they, they did not get that option. And just like they didn't get that option, this nation continues to put them in positions where they cannot have the options that they deserve. Now, I'll stop there on that piece. Aramis, if, or Ronald, if it's okay, I, 
Um, Aramis, I remember Rabbi Popko on our trip, and there was another moment around that Shabbos table where he, he talked about how his descendants, um, he can trace his lineage to a, to a, a famous rabbi, I can't remember which one in Eastern Europe, that was miles from a concentration camp. And, and how he said, I would never, never go back there to, to try to make a home. And the incredible challenge of what does it mean to try to make a home in the very place that was the place of your persecution? Yes. And I think, you know, the other thing I just wanted to share with you is, um, and and I that to me was an eye-opening moment. And I, I just, thinking about what does it mean to, to try to make a home in a place where your people were destroyed, were torn apart and that use of violence and, and, and how do you move forward from that? Um, just having that perspective gives me a gift. And, and the other thing which I just want to reflect back to you is that this idea of, um, you know, I, I will share with you, my father, uh, I was raised on the narrative that you described. Um, my father you know, would talk about the experience of Jews and having immigrated and, you know, uh, you know, the, and, and his experience of America um, as a place of opportunity and, um, and, and his uh, not understanding why the African American, why the black American community couldn't do that. Right. That's, that's what I was, that's what I was raised on. And, and I think that You've given me a great insight because it, the challenge of saying, of being able to hold two things that are both true, right? Which is, you know, for the Jewish community, there's it's been a great blessing, right? America has been a wonderful blessing and a place of opportunity. And I don't have to be defensive. And it doesn't, I, you, I know you watched my lesson from Shabbos, it doesn't make me smaller to say I can acknowledge that America also is founded with a great sin. And, and, and when I say those words, it doesn't, it doesn't make me less, but I think, I think you're right that a lot of, a lot of, I think a lot of Jewish Americans and a lot of Americans with that immigrant experience feel defensive because they feel like they have to do one narrative or the other, right? And the challenge of every mature soul is to say, can I hold two contradictory truths? Can I just be with it? Yeah. And, and Rabbi uh, Dan, that before you pass it, I, I think if I say this, it'll probably give perspective. I told our congregation Sunday the story of a father who had children before he was married. He was young and he was irresponsible. And so he forsook his responsibility to those children and um, eventually got his act together and uh, met a beautiful woman. They had a family. He worked hard you know, got a nice home for himself and children got a great education. He was a family man, a great husband and father. And then one day uh, his children that he had outside of marriage uh, re-engaged his life. And the results of not having him in their life showed in how, how they were built uh, it showed in the type of experience they grew up with. It showed in maybe a, a harshness in their attitude, uh, a, a pessimistic type of view on things, very critical and accusatory. And ultimately, uh, this father had a decision to make whether he was going to protect himself because of the changes he has made and the person he's become or whether he was going to empathize with the fact that while he succeeded over here, 
if it was a daughter that he never was in her life, maybe she never learned her value. Maybe the mom was forced to work two jobs and was never around uh, to, to, to look out for her, to help her with her homework. Maybe she was abused while no one was there to look out for her. Maybe she had esteem issues. Maybe she dealt with suicide. Maybe the anger and wondering why her dad isn't in her life, it, maybe it polluted all of her efforts and all her pursuits and all of her studies and all of her dreams. And, and, and it produced something that she didn't ask to become her reality. And then when she presented it to her father, if her father said, you ought to be happy that you're in my life now. Or if her father said, but look, I got a good house. You can come hang out with us when you're in town. If the father says, well, if you're not going to come to me respectfully, then I don't want you at the house at all because I am your father. Or the father can say, you're right. I screwed up. Yeah, I did well over here. But I did horrible over here. I can't imagine what it was like for you to have to struggle and navigate through all of your pain just to survive. And I can't change the past. But darn it, I can do everything in my power to be the best father that I can be to you today. And I believe that the challenge that we're dealing with in the United States when it comes to Blacks and its relationship with the United States is that the father is taking a prideful type of position to protect the progress that the father's made and not to bring shame to the father's image before the people that he loves. Instead of saying, you know what, family whom I love, meet the family that I didn't do right by. Right? And, and, and one of them is built look, on illusion and the other one is built on truth and honesty. truth. So, so hopefully that helps to give perspective on what it is to be black in America and to have a land that has done a lot of positive things, but in the process has caused damage on a people that should not be understated, understated or overlooked. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I think my response is going to be proven and how I respond and what I say. And as Aramis has pointed out a historical context, I want to say that African-Americans are not monolithic. And that's what I would want everyone to understand about each of us, is that we can't be lumped into categories, that we do come with many different experiences and many different accomplishments, you know, I often say to people, and I want it to be made known, I don't speak these things from my position. I speak these things for the disenfranchised and the discarded and the least of these and the left behind. I have a platform that provides me a voice of power. And so my job is to give power to the powerless, to give voice to the voiceless to speak to issues that, to be quite honest with, I don't struggle with on a daily basis. And I want people to understand that all African Americans are not disgruntled. All African Americans are not living in a depressed uh, state of economy. We, we are not undereducated. We are not underpaid. Uh, uh, there are a number of accomplished African Americans who are daily, in spite of the systems that are being handed to them, uh, still winning and winning big. And I want people to understand the African American community as their own. You know, um, we are not some anomaly. We are not some foreign species that needs to be understood through a separate set of lenses other than how any human wants to be valued and wants to be viewed. We have the same needs that you have. When we wake up, we aspire to do the same things that you do. We have children, we have spouses, we have family and friends. Um, and I want people to stop looking at us through the lenses that 
some mediums paint us through. Um, unfortunately, those are ideas that fuel economies through America. Uh, but that's not the reality of who the African American community is. Again, we have the same hopes, the same dreams, the same aspirations. I was driving through my neighborhood the other day and I had a profound moment right after this. I was watching a young boy, no more than eight years old, drive on his golf cart with his golf clubs. And I asked my wife, I said, why does he get to grow up like this? Why does he get to grow up with a life of privilege while some other young boy is somewhere dodging bullets, fighting and fending for his life? My question didn't come from whether he was Caucasian or whether he was African American or whether he was Jew or Gentile. My question came from, again, a human concern. And so as African Americans know we're not just walking around angry about things that happened in our past. We are Republicans and we are Democrats. Uh, we, again, range the spectrum of greatness and genius in America. We are thought leaders. We are entrepreneurs. We are politicians. We are educators. We, again, are people of value. And so when you ask me, how do I want someone to see us and what do I want those who are watching to know about the African American community? I want you to know that we're people. Um, the other day said that there are some that don't view us as people. I would love to say that Ahmaud Arbery was shot like a dog in the streets, but I can't say that because in America, we got laws that keep us from shooting dogs in the middle of the street. So I can't even reference what's being done to us to what we do to animals in America. How can we be viewed as less than valuable than an animal? You can get a greater sentence for executing a dog or fighting dogs in America than you can for killing a black man or a black woman. That's what I want people to pause and think about. Before we deflect the conversation and say, well, what if they do? I don't care if Ahmaud Aubrey walked away with every material in that house, if he stole everything. Let's, let's say he stole everything in the house. Guess what? This is America. We don't execute people for stealing. And so that's the greater conversation. Why aren't we appalled at the outcomes lest we believe that African Americans or Blacks or whatever you want to call us are less than? And so our conversation has to center around why do we look at them as subspecies? Why do we look at them as subhuman? Why do we look at them as less than where we seek to find a reason to justify these behaviors rather than alter them? And so what I want people to understand is that, again, our lives are valuable when we try to say that through protests and not protesting the flag, but taking opportunity of a moment to bring attention because where else do you protest? What else do you do to bring attention but disrupt a moment? So it wasn't disregard or disrespect for a flag that we died for, for a nation that we built for a flag to hang over. It wasn't in disregard for that. It was an opportunity to bring attention to, we just want you to say that we matter. Well, no, people had to say, well, all lives matter. Well, I heard somebody break it down and it was the most profound way to articulate why we say black lives matter. 
It would be like if your house is on fire and you call the fire department, the fire <laughs> engines show up and put water on everybody else's house but yours and say, well, all houses matter. Well, no, right now my house is on fire. <laughs> I want you to recognize that my house matters. And so we want people to know that our house is on fire and when we call the fire department, we want the water to go on our house right now. We're not denying or disrespecting the other houses on the block, but we're a house on the block too. And so what do I want somebody to know about me is that I'm a house on the block too. I have value, I have worth, and I'm worth rescuing and I'm worth saving. Rabbi. Um, so I, I want to uh, give an opportunity for people uh, to submit questions in the chat, sure. um, which I think we, you know, we can do for, uh, for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and Alan, maybe you can uh, articulate those. Uh, you know, Ronald, I'm just going to say, you know, and I sort of throw this out there to both of you as just a reaction to what, you know, I think, I think part of, uh, and I'm just, I can only share with you my personal experience, like I, part of what I find difficult is that, um, and, and I'm not trying to sound like some enlightened soul when I say this, right. but it's just so patently obvious and, 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 and to, to sort of think or act otherwise is so patently stupid and that um, it, it's difficult to, you know, to, to find, you know, to, to, it's difficult to, to find the words. Um, and yet, you know, I know part of, and yet I know that this moment, right, it's not enough to, to be silent, sure. right? These things have to be said. Yeah. That, um, and, but, the, you know, there is an incredible, incredulity that my god are we still having this conversation um and and yet you know aramis as you said if i if i'm you know if i feel any sort of fatigue about it like i can't imagine the fatigue, you know just the exhaustion of 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 living um you know of living with that yeah you know i and rabbi you know and i challenge people who hear these kind of conversations to ask yourself do I have to have them with my children? And if you don't have to tell your child how to handle a police stop, then you really need to start challenging yourself to understand these issues. Daily, I have to tell my son, who's a 23-year-old African-American male who has a nice car, I have to reinforce to him over and over. Ronnie, when they pull you over, turn your car off, put your hazards down, roll the windows down, cross your arms on the steering wheel, don't move. I have to go through it step by step over and over and repeat it to him at least every six months so that he knows what to do when he's stopped by the police. His dad, who's a former police officer, his uncle, who's retired chief of police, I still have to go over with him what to do when you stop by the police. If you haven't had to have that conversation with your son, then you need to start inquiring more, why do I have to have it and you don't? You know, we need to challenge ourselves about the things that have become the norms in certain communities that Quite honestly, what are you talking about? You know, I, can I make this statement here and I want everybody to hear it because I've been saying it, you know, like for some, yeah, it's easy to say, what are you talking about? Like the justice system isn't broke. Not when it works for you. You know, right. we have a justice system that works one way for one group of people and another way for another group of people. And until we 
look at the discrepancies in sentencing and when we look at the discretion that is being exercised to lock people up for a longer amount of time for the same exact crime, you know, these are things that we again have to start asking ourselves, why is that so? So before we say there's no institutional racism and there's no systemic racism, and okay, well then answer those questions for me. Why don't you have to have those conversations and why don't you have the same numbers that we have? So when you see these disproportionate uh, uh, amounts of calendar be, being given to, to poor communities, I don't even say African-American communities. Again, I'm speaking about the haves and the have-nots. And, and unfortunately, that is you know, proportionally leaning towards the side of black, of, of black and brown communities. Why are these disparities so great? Numbers don't lie. Let's look at our healthcare system. Numbers don't lie. Let's look at our education system. Numbers don't lie. I was a part of uh, doing the vision and the mission for the Durham public school systems and in writing that, in, in coming together with those stakeholders in our community, we were given the data as to what performing schools look like in the city of Durham and what underperforming schools look like in the city of Durham. Why is there this chasm in our educational system in the same community? Why is one, being, one population of people being served on a greater level than others? These are the questions that we have to answer and these are the tough questions that we have to be confronted with and then rather than offering an excuse, let's try to come up with a remedy. And what I'm tired of seeing is people making excuses as to why that's acceptable. Because we're human, if that were, again, I'm not affected by that. My daughter just graduated today, class president, first African-American class president, of Northwood High School. She's going on to ECU and Harad graduated at the top of her class. It's not my story, but how many other kids in that school is it their story? And how many other kids is it in my community that is their story? So I want you to know, this ain't the angry black man don't have nothing, so we all gotta get out of poverty speech. Now, I live on a, a golf course, and I'm saying that these injustices and these inequities have to stop whoever they affect. We have to level the playing field, and that's the conversation that I want to have. Um, Aramis, I, I want to, uh, I'm going to read one question from the chat and then uh, want to you know, want to hear your voice. Um, somebody wrote, um, well, I'm going to combine two questions. One of them is, is a question of, do you think that this moment is different um, from other moments? And, and, and when the intensity of this moment um, decreases, what do you, what do you hope um, and let's just be very, you know, what Daniel, what do you help Beth, Bethel um, is, is, should be doing or will be doing to increase racial equity and to, to, to level that playing field that Ronald described? Yeah. Well, I, I do believe this moment is different. And me and, me and millennials don't see eye to eye on everything. But one thing millennials uh, bring to the table is they they think outside of out of the box, and so what we see and as a, a father with three children, what's important to my children are it becomes important to me, and what we're seeing is there's a lot of young people of all different ethnicities, all different backgrounds and cultures and experiences, and they are looking at what I believe should have been seen 
clearly 150 years ago that this is wrong. It's not just wrong for blacks or people of color, it's wrong for our nation. And I believe this moment is different because even I look at so many protests and I can't find a black person in it. Right. And that, I mean, I don't know about you all, but sometimes I'm literally doing the test. I'm, I'm trying to find the black person in the crowd and I can't. I'm seeing photo after photo of families laid out in the middle of the road and they're not going anywhere, you know, and they look nothing like me. And what, uh, I believe that that tends to is really the, the fabric of what I believe dwells in the heart of every human being. And that is our God-given morality. Whether we choose to listen to it, respond to it or not, there is this sense of what's right and what's wrong. And what I believe has happened over time is that we've allowed our self-interest to become selfish. You know, self-interest in itself is not bad. But when self-interest all of a sudden begins to, uh, it begins to chip away at the fabric of morality so that you no longer see dignity for all humanity, then all of a sudden self-interest has become uh, bad. It's, it's not, anything wrong if I like basketball and Daniel you like basketball and Ronald like basketball and we're more prone to go to a basketball game than to watch a baseball game there's nothing wrong with that we all choose basketball let's roll the problem is if we choose basketball at the time when we see a car on fire on the side of the road and someone's struggling to get out the car and we're looking like dog I do see that that car is on fire and it looks like somebody might be in that car, but do we really want to be late for the game? You know, when it gets to that point that we can, we can no longer pump the brakes for what pleases us to do what should be a moral obligation for every human being when they see someone else in a hard place, then self-interest has become malplaced. And this is, I'm giving you a little insight into my own personal, uh, you know, what do you call it? Introflection and, 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 and my own personal meditation. And, and, and I'm challenging myself and, and I'm asking about my self-interest and I'm saying, is it, is, is it grounded in, in, in the morals by which I determined to live my life? Have they gone too far? And is it okay to adjust our self-interest? if it's in the interest of upholding the, the moral values that we say that we've embraced and we determined to live by. And I, I would join in and say the same. Yeah, this is a, totally different because I think that for once we're challenged to say, is this who we are as Americans? You know, again, uh, it happened to be raised through the atrocity that took place with George Floyd but I think that it called all of us to question, is this how we want to be viewed on a global scale as Americans? Is not black or white, but just, is this how we want to be viewed is, is how we treat each other. And so my ask of Bethel and to everyone watching is, that's why I make the point that I stand in a position of strength but I still have to use my strength for the weak. For those of That's you who right. stand in positions of strength and who are leaders in your community and who have pins in your hand because that's where the power is. Those of you who lead organizations and those of you who have financial prowess and those of you who have a voice, please use it. And if you don't get a bullhorn and use it in the town square, and if you don't go stand in front of the bull in downtown Durham, that's okay. But have the conversation in your house. Have it with your children. Have it with your grandchildren. Have it with your spouse. Is this who we want to be? 
Is this who we seek to be as a people? Is, are these the thoughts that we want representing us as Americans? And so that's, that would be my ask of everyone here is again, you know, and I keep saying this and I don't want to get misunderstood. I'm not looking for a kumbaya moment. I don't need us all to come together and have crumpets and tea. I believe that racist before this will be racist after this because you cannot raise the conscience of someone who has no conscience. But what we can do is raise those who have been apathetic, those who have turned a blind eye to things that you knew were wrong, to those who laughed at the joke, to those who embraced the moment that you should have rejected and let go. I want to raise the conscience of those who have a conscience and to a community of people who share a like conscience because of faith. I want us to start asking ourselves, will we continue to allow these things to happen? And if I can't change someone who has racist views or someone who continues to perpetuate these injustices, at least we can come together as a community and with all this within our power, make sure that this doesn't have an opportunity to live in our community. So if we continue to do what we're doing, Rabbi, if we continue to build before the storms, and if we continue to partner in community, and if we continue to plan together and live together and love one another and respect one another, which is everything that we share between Bethel and the River Church. In my closing, I say to you, Bethel, what you have given to the River Church in this moment has been a gift beyond what you could possibly understand or think. They'll, they won't talk about it on the news. We're not going to wake up tomorrow and read about it in the newspaper. But you gave people hope. Our congregation, knowing that you stood with us and that you're praying for us and that you love us and that you didn't turn a blind eye. I preached about it yesterday. Jesus says in our scriptures that I have needs to go through Samaria. I have a need to stop going around a place that I need to go in. He had the courage to go through Samaria. And I want to thank you tonight, each and every one of you. Thank you for having the courage to go through Samaria. There's something that's been ignored long enough something that has to be challenged and changed and we can't change it if we never challenge it. And your very presence tonight says, there's some people that are looking to challenge it, to change it. And so Rabbi, thank you for your love. Thank you for your heart. Man, I, I took a snippet of what you said to us and I saved it on my phone. And I'll forever keep it, man, because every time I get in that dark place, I'm going to pr play what you said to our congregation about how Bethel stands with us and stands for us. And I'll forever revisit that clip. Until the day I die, it'll be in whatever phone I have because it's going to be the thing that helps me fight this battle. It's going to be the thing that helps me have the courage to confront the injustices that are affecting people that I love, people that daily I wish would not have to go through what we're going through. I can't stand to see one more funeral. I can't stand to see one more hashtag I'm gonna have to make one more meme for somebody because a person of authority abused their authority. But tonight, Bethel, I thank you. Again, we're not a monolith, so I don't speak for every black person, but I speak for this black man. And from the depths of my heart and from the depths of my soul tonight, I love each of you. Again, as I look through and I see the faces of people 
that I was brought together with through tragedy and through injustice. It makes me grateful for moments of tragedy and injustice because it just galvanizes the great and it brings those of us who have a conscience together and we will always outweigh and outnumber those who have no conscience. And so tonight, this is the best of not just Durham, and I've always reminded you of that, but this is the best of America, and this is the reason that we have to hope. And so thank you, Rabbi, for doing this, man. I love you, my brother and my friend. You my brother and you are my friend. There's nobody that I hold more dear in my heart than you, man. Thank you. And thank you. I love you. I'm better because of you, man. Ronald, you said to me early this afternoon, we talked a little bit, and you said you started to thank me. And, and I said to you, no, 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 no. And it's not that I'm not taking your thanks, but in the middle of this for you and Aramis, I want you to know, I, I said to you, you, for you to give us this time and for you to give of yourselves in this moment is a gift to us. Um, it's a generosity of spirit. Um, I, I never, you know, you, you do so much in leading your communities. Um, you carry so much, and um, and it, you know, there's there's work that that we need to do, and I want to make sure that we um, that that it doesn't stop here. Um, and and you giving us of of yourselves um, is a tremendous gift. Um, I, Ronald, I want to say to you, <laughs> I wrote a little something for the for the end of this, mm -hmm. and and I remember how when we visited the River Church, Aramis, right after the the synagogue shooting in San Diego, we visited the River Church, and Ronald said to to us that night as we were in his church that. The, the shooting represents, that shooting represents the worst of America. And, and I, I know you know what happened to George Floyd was, was just one example. It was a horrible, horrific example of the worst parts of this country. And 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 but but Ronald reminded me that when we can talk with each other and when we do this sort of work, that it is the best and it is what's possible. And um, and and we are we want to continue um, to do that. Um, Aramis, I, I want to hear from you, and, and I'm, I'm just going to read one other thing from the chat. Uh, we're very practical, okay? Ronald said, you know, if you have the ability, if you have a, a pen, if you have a voice, if you, if you can help, you know, then help. Um, and somebody wrote, well, tell me, what are some good organizations that are doing uh, anti-racist work, that are doing important work that we should know about, that that we can support um, and and we want to you know we want to do that because it's the right thing and and I want to do that to to thank you also um, but Aramis let me give you the last word because it's it's appropriate and true yep and uh, thank you Rabbi Daniel once again um, you know I'm not going to get emotional because I told myself I wasn't but um, especially as Bishop kind of messed me up. I'm kind of like froze up because everything he said rings true. And uh, when you reached out to me, um, I'm gonna be honest, and I know we're actually live on Facebook, but I, I received the most receptivity 
of support during this time from our brothers and sisters from the Jewish community. And um, I consider that a blessing. And I want to say thank you. And I don't want what I'm going to say next to clutter how appreciative I am for your support because I would have thought I would have gotten it more from um, my own community or the community of my faith. And it, it brings to the forefront areas of challenge and areas that need to be worked on even within the Christian faith. Um, but what I'll say is uh, I firmly believe and what I take from our scriptures, the ministry of reconciliation, being reconciled to God and being reconciled to one another. And that requires us uh, intentionally putting ourselves in proximity with one another. It has to be intentional. If we don't be intentional about it, it won't be done. Uh, we have to make time. Uh, there's a rabbi in Detroit that I, I, I do, uh, we study toward the Torah portion every Wednesday um, from 11 to 12. Mm -hmm. We are intentional about staying connected and, and not just doing things off of crisis. And I think that that's what's most important is that in your moral, in your moral priorities, when you say this has to change, a, you said practical measures. A practical measure is who am I going to engage that otherwise I wouldn't engage? Who am I going to talk to that otherwise I would come to preconceived notions about? What kind of thing can I do regularly to just add to the diversity of my understanding and my experience? Because, and I know we have to go, because ultimately social and cultural conditioning really impacts how we see the world. And the only way to see the bigger world differently is to intentionally uh, step outside of our world's experience. And so that's what I will offer in closing to those that want to become more engaged. Um, not only do we, what we love to have you engage the black community, but we would love to engage your community. And um, here at Breakers, we actually run a community center for those that say, who can we support? I can tell you one sure uh, organization in Detroit, and that is Bethel Community Transformation Center. And the reason is we run it right out of this synagogue. Right now, you're looking at uh, the office of what was once Ra Rabbi Hertz. 100 years ago, he, he occupied this office because our church is run in a former uh, Jewish temple. And so um, we determined to ensure that we preserve the historicity of the experience and the impact that the Jewish community had in our neighborhood but also to use it as a way to increase relationships between the Jewish community and the black community and the broader community in the Metro Detroit area. And so we are doing reconciliation work. We are doing interfaith work. We are using this community center uh, to build strong relationships and allies uh, throughout this area and beyond. And so if you're interested, you can go to bctcdetroit.org and uh, find more information. And I would, be happy to pass more information for other places that I know uh, to Rabbi Daniel. But to, to Rabbi Daniel and, and to your entire congregation, thank you so much. The love is felt. The love is healing. Um, your, your openness and your willingness to hear us and not just hear but listen, uh, it's ministering to me as a pastor, as a leader, is, is providing me with the strength that I know I need to continue this fight. So thank you and God bless you. Mm. Thank you, my friends. Um, please pass on that information. And uh, I love the fact that it's called Bethel. That's fantastic. Good branding. I love it. And, um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I appreciate especially being intentional. Um, you know, Hevre, I want to say that um, we need to continue uh, to develop uh, our work. Um, and I'll say, especially here locally, um, Aramis, I miss you, but you know, you get, you're all the way in Detroit, but Bishop, um, you know, we, we were working on some things to do more with the River Church uh, that got thrown off by COVID, but 
Um, we, we need to be intentional about it. We need to, I know that uh, Rachel Bierman, who um, has a connection with Ruth um, in, in, uh, in the River Church, and they were working on the trip to DC together. Um, and we need, to, we need to do more um, and, and keep that as part of a regular thing. Um, and, and, and as Bishop said, you know, uh, they, the things can, can help us in moments of good and they're right and they help us to be better in who we are. So thank you everybody for coming uh, to join us on Zoom tonight. Um, may God bless us with better days, with better days, with better days. Um, and, uh, and, and not only that should come from God, but it should come from our, from the work of our hands as well. Rabbi, before we leave, can I do one thing while everybody is still on? Of course. And it's to my dear brother, Aramis. I, I believe in patterns and I believe that what we place before people matters. And so I need to put this lasting image in the minds and the hearts of everybody who's watching. And I just want to say, I love you, my brother. I admire you. You baptized me in the River Jordan, which is one of the most epic and special moments of my life. I admire the work that you do as a leader. I admire the husband that you are, the father that you are, the leader that you are in that great city of Detroit. You know, my roots and my heart is always in Detroit, man. And the work that you do continuously there, I hear about it, I celebrate it. I've been on radio in Detroit now for the last week. Um, and just uh, every morning I've been on with Dr. Cunningham and, uh, and with Dr. Holly <laughs> and yes. relationships that we both share. And I just want them to see that Black men are not in competition. We are completing one another. We stand in awe and admiration of each other. And man, our communities are better because of leaders like you. Our world is better because we have leaders like you. And I'm grateful that you're my brother and you're my friend. I love you much, man. And I appreciate you. Thank you for tonight. If if you have one more second, I'm going to share the screen. I've been waiting to do this. So this is a beautiful moment. I just want to bring us back to, <laughs> this was from <laughs> the Church of the, of the Nativity in yeah. Bethlehem. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have the baptism picture, but I, but I found this one. I said, that's a beautiful. Absolutely, man. Yeah, memories yes. of, a, of a wonderful trip. So, yes. Absolutely. All right. Everybody take care. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Love you, Bishop. Love you, Dan. Love you too, Hermes. God bless. Thank you. God bless. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs>